بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ادعوا إلى سبيل ربك بالحكمة والموعظة الحسنة أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم وإن تتولوا يستبدل قوما غيركم ثم لا يكون امثالكم صدق الله صدق الله المران عظيم respected brethren and my dear children i have read to you the last segment of the last verse of sura muhammad صلى الله عليه وسلم Where do you find Surah Muhammad? You see, it is the non-Arab, and I take it most of us here are non-Arabs. It is very, very difficult to find these references. When somebody tells you, Surah Ikhlas, you don't know where to find it. Somebody tells you Surah Yasin, where will you find it? People are used to Yasin Sharif. Generally, our people, when somebody is dying, they say, look, if you read Yasin Sharif, your soul will depart the, the, the person who is in Sakarat al-Maut, who is in the throes of death, this is his soul will depart more easily. So a lot of our people are used to finding Yaseen. But where will you find Muhammad in the Arabic Quran? Very difficult. There is a Quran available, originally printed in this country, one by Abdullah Yusuf Ali, printed in Lahore by the Ashraf Publications, by Abdullah Yusuf Ali. This particular translation has an advantage of having an index, a very comprehensive index at the back of it. And if you open the index just like a dictionary, look for Surah Muhammad. Whatever reference people give you, make a habit of going and checking up, not that you distrust the speaker, but by checking up and verifying it will become your property. That knowledge becomes your own property. So you can reuse it. And you can polish it and your knowledge will grow, grow around that little information that was given to you. Check up the verses. I said Surah Muhammad, under M you find Muhammad and it will tell you chapter 47. So 47 is easy to find because every page in this volume is numbered. Then I say verse 38, 38 is easy to find. Make use of this book. And this translation, if you get it, you need it. All those who speak English, this translation is imperative. Even the Arab who understands Arabic direct, the Arabic of the Quran direct, you still need an English translation if you want to articulate in English. Simply because you get the right terminology. You understand it well. But in trying to put it to the outsider, you might use terms and expressions which compromises your belief. So, for that reason, everyone needs a translation. If you want to speak English, you want to improve your English, there isn't a better book. You do not have to read Shakespeare or Milton to improve even your English. This book will do the job. Inshallah. So, Allah tells us in this last segment, last part of the last verse of Surah Muhammad, وَإِن تَتَوَلَّوْ يَسْتَبْدِلْ قَوْمًا غَيْرَكُمْ that, O Muslims, if you do not fulfill your obligations, the trust that Allah Baritara has reposed upon you, imposed upon you, for being the khaira ummatin, you are the best of people, if you do not carry out your responsibilities, say, yastabdil qawman ghayrakum. He will substitute in your place another people. Thumma la yakunu amthalakum. And then they won't be like you. It's a warning given to us, Muslims. Every position of honor carries with it certain responsibilities. If you are the best of people, that honor, that privilege carries with it responsibilities. There is no honor without responsibility. So Allah Bari Ta'ala imposes the responsibility of sharing this deen with the rest of mankind. 
And in the system of religion, in the history of religions, Allah Bari Ta'ala chose the Jews, a very peculiar people. Allah in his wisdom, he knew why, why he chose the Jews. To me, they seem to be the guinea pigs of mankind for experimental purposes. You know, you experiment on, on guinea pigs. You know guinea pigs, those little animals, they experiment, the scientists. What, because they love the guinea pigs? No. He said, that animal is the most suitable animal for experimentation. Similarly, Allah bari ta'ala in his wisdom, he chose the Jews. And he sent prophets after prophets to them. When we take the names of some of our children, they all, most of them carry Jewish names. This is Musa, Dawood, Suleiman, Ishaq, Jewish names, Jewish names, Jewish names. Did you know that? But we take these names, we give our children these names, not because they are Jewish, because these are the names of the righteous servants of God, the prophets of God. So we give our children these names, but in origin they are all Jewish. And when we Muslims, we affirm that we believe in the four heavenly books, we say we believe in the Torah, we believe in the Zabur, we believe in the Injil, and we believe in the Furqan, the Holy Quran. Out of these four books that we name, 75% are Jewish books. The Torah was given to Hazrat Musa alayhi salam, a Jew. The Zabur was given to Hazrat Dawud alayhi salam, a Jew. The Injil was given to Hazrat Isa alayhi salam, a Jew. Jew, Jew, Jew. I don't know. Well, for God Almighty, in his wisdom, he knows why. He chose the Jews. There is some little secret revealed in this book about certain idiosyncrasies. We all have idiosyncrasies. Every nation has its idiosyncrasies. Certain peculiarities, which might seem funny to us, which might be an asset. You see, Allah Bari Ta'ala, when he gave the good news of the birth of his first son, Ismail, he describes Ismail as Ghulaman Halima in the Quran. Ghulaman Halima. Then later on, after 13 years, he gives our Hazrat Ibrahim alayhi salam and again a news of the birth of another son, Ishaq alayhi salam. And now he says, Ghulaman Alima. What was Allah trying to do? Trying to rhyme it? Halima, Alima, so it sounds nicer because it's Halima and Halima, it sounds monotonous. No, no. There's a purpose. Allah Barit Allah, when He chooses the word, He knows why He used the word. We don't know. We take it, mashallah, beautiful, nice rhyming, music. But no, there is something in the Jew. The children of Ishaq alayhi salam, the children of Ismail alayhi salam has their peculiarities. They are Halima, humble, submissive people to Allah's commands. Prepared for sacrifice. Ismail alayhi salam, prepared for sacrifice. The Jew, children of Ishaq alayhi salam, Alima, knowledgeable, intellectual. And they seem to be running the world. A handful of them, there are about 15 million in the world, they make the American dog you know, the tail, the six million Jews are wagging the American dog. You know that? There is something in them. Allah has given them something. They shake the world. In my country, a handful of them, they are running the whole industries. Everything is under their control. A handful of them. Ghulam and Alima. So, Allah Bari Ta'ala, everyone, I say, has got his idiosyncrasies. We have our shortcomings. We have certain assets. Talents. So he chose the Jews. He sends prophets after prophets to them to do his job of delivering the knowledge of God to the rest of mankind. He chose them for that. And they were the Khaira Ummatin of their time. The best of people for their time were the Jews. But they didn't carry out their orders, their obligations. They didn't fulfill them. So Hazrat Isa alayhi salam, a Jew among the Jews, he tells the Jews, his own people, 
He says that the kingdom of God, this honor, this privilege, being the khaira ummatin, the best of people, that this kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a nation bringing forth the fruits thereof. You don't produce the fruits. This honor, privilege is taken away from you and given to somebody else. Bringing forth the fruits thereof. And he did it. He chose the Arabs. And this is also another system we noticed in Allah's workings with his creation that when he substitutes a people by another people, he chooses a people whom you look down upon. The most despicable of people in your sight, Allah makes them to sit on your head. Watch, see in history, he's doing it all the time. Who comes along and, and then destabilizes you? The people that you are looking down upon, you're laughing upon. He makes them to sit on your head. And they were the Jews, they were laughing upon the Arabs. They're looking down upon their Arab cousins. They insinuated that Bibi Hajra, the mother of Ismail alayhi salam, the progenitor of the Arab races, she was a bond woman, a lonely, a slave woman, and as such her children are worthless rubbish. They say illegitimate. The Jews, they say these are the illegitimate offsprings because Sarah was his legitimate wife and this was just a woman taken in. Londi, ki Londi ki olad hai. They say Hagarines. Hazra ki olad, these are the Hagarines. And they call the religion followed by the children of Hagar as Hagarism. Not Islam, Hagarism. Hazra ki olad ka, ka, ka deen. Hagarism. They have been looking down upon the Arab cousins for 3,000 years. And they still look down upon them today. Allah Bari Tala chose them to sit on their head, become masters of the world. He chose a people, an illiterate people, an ignorant people, an ummi people with an ummi prophet. And he made them masters of the world. A Jewish medical man writing a book on medicine. He happens to speak about the contribution of the Muslims to medicine. But when he is giving credit to his Arab cousins, he has a dig at them, at the Muslims, at the Arabs. He says, goat herds and camel drivers sitting on the throne of the Caesars. Imagine, this goat herds, charwahe, no? camel drivers, they are now sitting on the throne of the Caesars and then they are ruling the world. In Spain, masters of arts and sciences. What a joke. What a joke. But here is the beauty. The beauty is that this is what Allah does. This shows that this is the work of Allah. That He picks you out from the dust, from the gutter, and puts you right on the top. This is not the work of the Arabs. They couldn't have done it. Allah does it. To Him it's a sting that is having a big at His Arab cousins. But it is really the uh, highest testimony you can give that this is what Allah can do right from the gutter, right to the top. He chose the Arabs. And in time, our Arab brethren, Allah made them to spread out. And they spread out. And they went to Spain. The only Semitic people that went to Europe as kings, as rulers, were the Muslims. The Phoenicians, before Jesus, they had gone to Europe as traders. The Jews had gone to Europe, Semitic people, as fugitives or captives. The Muslims went there as rulers, as masters. And they ruled Spain for 800 years. No Christian nation has ruled Muslims yet for that period of time. The longest that they ruled Muslims was in Mozambique. Mozambique was a Muslim country. Did you know that? The name of that territory was the governor, when the Portuguese took over with the superior gunpowder, was Musa bin Baik, an Arab. Musa bin Baik. The Portuguese couldn't say Musa bin Baik, so they said Mozambique, Muslim territory. They couldn't say Jabal Tariq. Jabal means the mountain of Tariq, the man, the first Muslim who crossed over from Africa into Spain, into Europe, was a Tariq. And this is the Jabal of Hattarik, Jabal of Tariq, they say Jabal al -ta. So you miss the mark, you don't know who they talk, what they are talking about. Ma'manullah in Philippines, 
They say Manila. There, when he went there, he reached, they said, this is by the help of Allah we reach here. Ma'amanullah, they said Manila. The longest that they ruled was in Mozambique, 500 years, the Portuguese. The second longest was in Indonesia, they ruled there for 300 years, the Dutch. The Muslims ruled Spain for 800 years. And 800 years, our Arab cousins, brothers, they were reading the Quran. And they understood the Quran. They understood Arabic. It was their mother tongue. But they didn't heed the warnings. Allah is speaking to them. He's describing scenes, events in history, which from which they have to learn a lesson. And in bad benefits. They're reading in the masajids and the hafiz of Quran among the Arabs and generally when we're making a recitation of the Quran, Tilawat Quran, they're reading Kam taraku min jannatin wa uyun wa zu'in wa makamin kareem wa ni'matin kanu fiha fatihin kazalika awrasnaha qawman akhareen fama bakat alayhimu samaa'u wal ardu wa makanu min zareen They read it and Again and again, they read it. What are they reading? They understood what Allah was telling them. Kamtara kum jannatin wa uyun. Say, how many were the gardens and the fountains they left behind? Wazoom wa makam in kareem and confused and monumental buildings. Wa ni'matin kanu fiha fatihin and wealth and the amenities of life in which they took so much delight. Kazalika. Awrasnaha kawman akhareen Thus other people were made to inherit these things. فَمَا بَقَتْ عَلَيْهِمُ السَّمَاءُ وَالْأَرْضُ وَمَا كَانُوا مُنْزَرِينَ And neither the heavens nor the earth shed a tear for them, nor was respite given to them anymore. When the time came, wipe them out. Get them out of the way. They're not performing their duties. They don't carry out their responsibilities. Get them out of the way. Hadith. يَسْتَبْدِلْ قَوْمًا غَيْرَكُمْ Substitute in your place another people. After 800 years, Wiped out to a man. There was not one man left in that country after 800 years to give the azar. What a defeat. What a disgrace. No nation has lost so heavily. Not one man left in that country to give the azar. The only thing we left behind was those monuments and those fountains. Yes, they were reading about the fountains and the gardens and the monumental buildings. But they were relating that to Firaun in Egypt. The fool, he didn't heed the warning. He was given warnings after warnings, plagues after plagues. But the fool, he didn't listen. <laughs> Allah destroyed them. Firaun <laughs> and his people, his army. You remember? Yes. The fools are not thinking that they are in the firing line. They are in the firing line. But they're laughing at the other fellow. This is human nature. We always laugh at the other guy. We are in the fire ourselves, but we're laughing at the other fellow. Time came, Allah says, Fatarabbasu. You don't carry out your duty and response, you wait. And the fools waited. 800 years they waited. Allah waited. He's a subur, he's long suffering, he's patient. He waited for 800 years. And in 800 years, you couldn't do the job. Why didn't you do the job? Because he said, These wine bibbers, Daru Pini Wale Pittaglob, these pig eaters, Suvar Khane Wale, what can they understand about Islam? That's the mentality. This was the mentality of our brethren. These pig eaters and wine beavers, what can they understand about Islam? Forgetting that they themselves were worse. The Arabs were worse of the Ayyamul Jahiliya. They married their stepmothers, they buried their daughters alive, fratricidal wars, drunkards, adulterers, gamblers. The Gibbon, the master historian, describes them. He says, the human brute, almost without sense, is poorly distinguished from the rest of the animal creation. The only thing that makes him different from the animal is the form. This form, fi ahsani taqween, that Allah made him in the best of forms, otherwise he's worse than animals. And Allah could change him, could transform him, to become the torchbearers of light and learning. No, but if he can change the, the, the Spanish, can he? No, so they kept their women, they married them, maybe, they married them, they didn't convert them, because Islam allows. These fools today are talking about Islam allows. What it allows? 
And you can marry Jewesses and you can marry Christian women. Eh? And do what, do what with them? Hmm? Do you get children to go to church? Believe that Jesus is God going to hell? Your wife is going to go to hell and you say you love her? You hypocrites? You bring wives from Europe? By all means, change them, convert them. By all means, make them better Muslims. If you can't make them better Muslims than your mother at home, than your sister at home, than your sister-in-law at home, I say don't tempt providence. You fools, don't do any such silly things. Because you can't. You are not men anymore. You have different standards. The standards of your forefathers are not with you. <laughs> like one of our shire, he says, he says, Sheikh Sahib bhi to parde ke koi hami nahi. This Sheikh Sahib, this learned man, he is also not a guy pro parda. He is not for parda. Sheikh Sahib bhi to parde ke koi hami nahi. Muft mein kalich ke larke unse badzan ho gaye. He said, for no reason, these college university students are getting offended with the Sheikh Saab. Muft mein kalich ke larke unse badzan ho gaye. Waz mein farma diya kal aapne ye saaf saaf. Yesterday in his sermon, he gave delivered the message, you know, very, very clearly. Muft. بعض میں فرما دیا کل آپ نے یہ صاف صاف پردہ آخر کس سے ہو جب مرد ہی زن ہو گئے سی اگینس ہوں آئیو گئے میں پردہ when the men themselves I have become effeminate emasculated castrated animals like you can't speak to your wives anymore to tell her what to do and what not to do you're not men anymore and you want to make پردہ against who says the Sheikh Saab so, I said, don't tempt providence. They tempted providence. They brought in Christian women. They kept them. They begat children. And their very children destroyed them. Because you didn't do the job. The job was a complete job. Make them your own. In thought, faith, in every aspect, they should be you. No, 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 no. He said, the mother is going to church. Islam gives the freedom of religion. Can you stop your wife saying, the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, being shirk, going to hell? No, no, you can't. You haven't got the guts to do that. But Islam allows you, you say. So you allowed them, and this is what you did. Destroyed the whole Muslim nation. Now, coming nearer home. Cyprus. In Cyprus, our Turkish brethren ruled that country, that island, for 400 years. And in 400 years, they didn't convert 400 Greek families to Islam. You know that? Had it not been for the strong arm of Turkey, each and every Turk on Cyprus would have been wiped out by now. It's Turkey who is keeping these free pride Turks alive. Coming still nearer home. Modern Iraq, old time. Baghdad, Samarkand, Bukhara, and the Harun al-Rashid, Mamun al-Rashid. We, we read that they created a veritable fairy land. Fairy land. Those scenes that existed then, you can't reproduce them except on films. On films they can do anything, they can show you anything. But in real life, of course Islamabad is coming somewhere near it. But not near enough to what existed then. The beauty. On the borders with the Mongols. You remember Jahangir Khan? Naam suna hai? Jahangir Khan, Halaku Khan. The Mongols. Khan Khan. <laughs> but these modern Khans are different. We have the Pathan Khans and the Punjabi Khans, and we also have some Gujarati Khans. No, those are the real Khans, you see. Those Khans, there is the Mongols, Mongols, the Mughals, the Mongols. So, what about them? What about the deen of Islam for them? Ah, the barbarians, what can they under understand about Islam? That mentality is a mentality I'm describing to you. The mentality in Spain, the mentality in Cyprus, the mentality in the Middle East. Mentality. What can they understand, these barbarians? Allah says, Fatah Basu. You wait. And they waited. We waited. For what? For destruction. Hatta yati Allah bi amri until Allah's decision comes about for your destruction. And you waited for that. They waited. Allah Ta'ala doesn't come down with a whip from heaven to beat you up. He says, come on, he activates. He activates. He says, look, these guys here, easy meat, easy meat, sitting on their backsides, having a good time, go and wipe them out. And destroy the Islamic Empire. Massacre, massacre, unbelievable. Demoralize, utterly. 
when we hear the stories about the demoralization, demoralization of the Muslims, unbelievable. You can't believe that one Mongol can drive a hundred Muslims like sheep and goats. That's a story. Utterly demoralized by these Mongols. It is said that one Mongol, somehow he collided with a Muslim. And he lost his temper. So can't you see where you're going? And die too? You're blind? So bend down. He said, I'll, bring, I'll chop off your head. So the poor Muslim, he bent down. He bent down. He said, bend down. So he bent. And the man remembered, he said, I forgot my sword at home. He said, you wait. I'm coming. He went home. He brought the sword. The Muslim was still there. <laughs> yes, we laugh. We can reach that stage. We have reached that stage in India. Hundred million Muslims or more, you say. We reach that stage. Why? One thousand years we rule this subcontinent. We were masters of this subcontinent for a thousand years. After a thousand years of Muslim rule, eventually when partition takes place, the Muslim gets one quarter, the Hindu gets three quarter. Why? You didn't do the job. Thousand years. You couldn't do the job. Power is in your hand, education, livelihood, everything is in your hands, prestige is in your hands, but you didn't do the job and we are paying the price. Are we going to learn a lesson today? No, no, no. This is one thing man learns from history and that one thing is nothing. We laugh at the fools. The guys in Spain laughing at the Egyptians. We in Baghdad, Samarkand, and Bukhara laughing at the Spanish Muslims. We today, we laugh at the Turks. We laugh at the Arabs. Fools, for a thousand years, the Jews were coming into your midst. They were seeking refuge. Every time there was persecution in Europe, pogroms, every Easter, the Christians reminded themselves that these are Christ killers. They killed our God. So they killed their men and women, and they raped their women, and they burned their homes, and they fled, and they fled to Muslim lands, and the Arabs says, Ahlan wa Sahlan. That's why I laugh. Ahlan wa sahlan, family and plain, and they lived in your midst. And in a thousand years, we couldn't convert a thousand Jewish families to Islam. There's something wrong with Islam or with us. Something wrong. Allah says, Li yuzahira hu ala dina kulli. He's given you a deen just to master, overcome, and supersede them all. But we couldn't make a dent in the Christians of Spain. We couldn't make a dent among the Jews who sought our hospitality our protection. You couldn't even do it to them. And here you rule for a thousand years and you didn't do the job. Today, when we are speaking to our brethren, I said, look, the solution to our problem is change the people, convert them. Because numerically, you can never catch up with the Hindus in India. Because they are breeding faster than you. As it is, they are so many times more than you. And they are breeding faster than you. So up to Yom al there is no chance. No chance you're going to catch up with them. So you'll ever be in the gutter. You'll ever be in this position, being the footballs of people, being the doormats of people, ever. So what to do? I said, look, there are people hungry for recognition in that part of the world. In India, they want recognition. We call them untouchables. Hum kehte hai, dher hai, chamar hai. Dher and chamar. Untouchables. They want recognition. You won't give them. You are Muslims today, but you are no better than the caste Hindus, the Brahman, the Hindu, my race, the Gujaratis, the Banyas. You are no better than them. Maybe there is a difference of degrees between them and us. We are a little less racist than they, but we are no less racist. All of us, there isn't a community in our midst who can say, look, we are not. The Pathan says, I'm Pathan. The Punjabi says, I'm Punjabi. The Sindhi has also something to fight about. And so the Bengali. Everybody has something about him. He makes him feel good. So he feels he's better than the other. And we have been in this country. Now, Pakistan established the only, the first country on the map of the world. On the ticket of Islam, we established a nation. Ticket of Islam. Yeah. We will create an Islamic state. And all will be Muslim-like, good Muslims. 
And I was one of those. As a young man, I was aspiring, says MashaAllah. I was fighting for it. For Pakistan. As a schoolboy, I was fighting for Pakistan. And Pakistan got established in 47. In 49, with my wife and children, I made a hijra to Pakistan. Why? No force of circumstances. No, nobody forced me. I had a good job. I had a good home. Everything was fine. I had wife and two children. I said, no, I must go to Pakistan to become a Pakka Muslim. <laughs> That's what brought me to this country. I lived here with you people for three years. Three years I lived in Karachi. I came to Peshawar. I came. There was no Islamabad then. Rawal Pindi and so on. I went as far as Muzaffarabad. I came twice to Lahore. But I stayed in Karachi. After three years, I was worse than what I was when I left South Africa. You see, I was thinking the environment. Environment will have effect on me and my children. Because we are weak. We are all weak. Allah says, Wa khalakal insan of I says, Allah has made man weak. We are all weak. We need support, help of one another, encouragement from one another. So I thought that will do the job. By staying among the Pakistanis, Pak Musliman, Ham bi Pak ban jayenge. But it did happen, so I went. And I think maybe there was also a blessing in that. Otherwise, I wouldn't be standing here today. Because I would be making money, I tell you. In Karachi, I would have been making money. Yes, I'd be one of those newly rich guys. But Allah knows best. I had to come to Pakistan, so that urge, that thinking about going to Pakistan will be out of my system. Otherwise, I couldn't be at rest. No matter what I did in South Africa, I would never have had peace. Because the mind was Pakistan, 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 and then Pakistan, that thing would never have gone. So I come and I go. <laughs> right. After 40 years, we haven't become Pakistanis. You know that? See, in my field, the field that I am now occupied in, trying to bring people from outside the pale of Islam to Islam, I bring them in make them Muslim. So I have been listening from my youth, you know, when I'm talking to people, trying to convert them. He says, you know, the old people say, he says, you know, Charlie's baras lagte hain isko musliman banne ko. So it will take 40 years for this guy to be Islamized, to become a Muslim. Meaning that the natural reflexes of a Muslim will only come into this new convert, it will take 40 years, means a lifetime. You know, when he sees the pig, pork hanging in the butchery, that he can automatically Start spitting automatically. Mm. That will take him 40 years. This is napak. This is unclean. To reach that mental reaction, it will take you 40 years. Charlie's Baras Lakte hai, wo kehte hai, Buddha lo kehte hai, Buddha now. This is, this is to become a Muslim. I says, you know what? Now I'm discovering that in 40 years we didn't become Pakistanis yet. Forget being Muslims. You haven't become Pakistani. He says, what are you? He says, I'm Pathan, Pakhtun. Right? Pakhtun is hitting the Mohajir. Mohajir is still a Mohajir. Pakhtun is still a Pakhtun. The Sindhi is still a Sindhi. The Punjabi is still a Sindhi. Punjabi, everybody, you are what you wear. Humara Iqbal rota tha bechara. Ki yun to Sayyid bhi ho, Mirza bhi ho, Afghan bhi ho. Yun to Sayyid bhi ho, Mirza bhi ho, Afghan bhi ho. Tum sabhi kuch ho, batao to Musalman bhi ho. Musalman to jane do, Pakistani hum nahi bane chalish baras me. So you're saying, what is it? This is it that we are not carrying out our responsibilities. Because if you start opening your mouth, you start delivering the message, you're trying to Islamize other people. You yourself imbibe those qualities. You want to make a pretense that you are not what you really are. You want to be a little good, appear good. We have certain idiosyncrasies, habits, bad habits. The best way to get rid of the bad habit is to preach against that. But you are a victim yourself, yes, but preach against it. This is another way, indirect way of changing, reforming yourself. The other way is, be good and you talk good. That's one way. You be an example of what you are preaching. The other way is, you preach against the thing that is in you which deserves condemnation. Preach to the others. Nicotine. Very bad. You know what, what it does? I can give you statistics. You see, lung cancer, blood pressure, shortening your life, insurance companies, they victimize you, 10% extra premium for your insurance policies, all this. You say, look man, and your lungs polluting the atmosphere, wasting money, unwholesome thing, and 
your potency is reduced by 10%, says this biologist. Can you imagine? And you're just squandering away, throwing away, you fools. What's wrong with you? People will give anything to get 10% extra potency, and you just throwing it away. So, but now I have a habit for nicotine, and I'm talking against it. While talking, talking, the tendency is there by habit. My hand goes into the pocket, and I'm taking out my packet of fags, cigarettes. But before I do that, I say, well, I've been just talking to you people, telling you what a horrible thing it is. So, leave it for the time being. That is subtle brainwashing. By telling you, I'm brainwashing myself. So if you start propagating Islam, the beauties of Islam, you can't help being affected by what you're preaching. But we have not done the job, and we are not likely to do the job. You know why? Because we are really not equipped. You see, South African students, Muslim students, you have a couple here, I understand. A lot of our young men are sent to Deoband and Jalalabad. It's India, India. Deoband and Jalalabad. They become alims. Some of them we send them to Rawal Pindi. There is an institution there to become alims. About these South African Muslim students in Jalalabad and Deoband, I have been reading the annual meeting reports. And in the reports I've been reading again and again that the students are passing resolutions that when we return to Africa, we will propagate Islam. When we return to Africa, qualified, we will propagate Islam. And I'm watching, I'm waiting for them, and they come. Returning home, they're teaching little children, Alif Bet or they're doing our imamat for us, Mashallah, or helping the fathers back in the businesses, back in the business. There is not one alim doing propagation. Not one. So I'm thinking, my children are all hypocrites, munafiks. And you know, the darja, the position of the munafik, Allah says, Inna al-munafikina fi darakil asfali min al So most certainly the munafik will be in the deepest depth of Jahannam, hellfire. Is this the destiny of my children? They sacrificed so much, they went into an inhospitable country, unhygienic conditions, poor food, and they spent five years, ten years, and they return. Hypocrites all. Mm, I can't accept that. Then what happened? When they pass resolutions, I say they were sincere. My children, they're sincere. But why aren't they doing it? Because they were not equipped. You can only take out what is put in. You know, in our computer, Allah's God-given computer, whatever is put in comes out. The American says in the human computer, electronic machine, he says, garbage in, garbage out. Whatever bhusa bharte hai, wo bhusa nikalta hai. And it's natural. What you put in is going to come out. In other words, your, your, your teachers and your professors, whatever they're putting in, the same thing is going to come out when you go out from here. Nothing, nothing else. Now, man, what you think when you came in, what ideas you had, all will be lost. Whatever they are programming you with, that is what is going to come out. They are programmed with, I tell you what they are programmed with. They return with new, new ideas. Now they come to us and they tell us, our own children, he said, you see, all these while, you know, it says our people, when we make salat, after salat, we read dua, safatiha. So when we read this dua, our Imams were leading us, they were reading it loudly. Al-Fatiha! So everybody starts. You see? And we read, and he says, you know, he reads uh, Fatiha and this and those, all those beautiful Arabic blessings. And we say, Ameen, 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 Sawakur Dawan, and Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen. That is what, 100%, every masjid in the country, this is what was prevailing. Now our young men come along, they got new knowledge. They said, you see, Allah is not deaf. Allah behra nahi hai. He was deaf for 1400 years. Now his ears are open. They in yes, they look. So now, because Allah is not deaf, so Allahumma, so everybody lifts up the hand. And then the Mulvi is reading to himself. There's a wakhu dawan on alhamdulillah rabbil alamin. What happened? He said, no. He said, he's reading it silently and Allah is not deaf. Oh, sunta hai. 
I said, but look, man, my, I'm deaf. My children, the new convert, he wants to know. He wants to know what you're talking, what you're doing. He doesn't know. I said, look, if you read it loudly, through the year the poor fellow will imbibe so much. A lot of things that I'm speaking to you now, I didn't actually open the Quran to learn verses. I didn't. It's only listening, listening, listening. Through the year, I learned a lot of things. So now, we are depriving the new convert, the Muslim, hardly any Muslim in the community, he can read a dua. Hardly any Muslim. You can't tell anybody, right, Fatiha Bardo? He says, you. <laughs> Nobody is capable, and but the poor Alim, he doesn't know. He doesn't know that. That all his congregation, they are bichare kete ke kore and kore means absolutely blank. You didn't teach them, and now you're depriving them of the pleasure of listening to Allah's kalam or the dua. You learn something new. Whether now you should lift up your hands for dua or stand straight and make dua. Whether you must say, say salami or no salami. Busy, busy, busy. Everybody is busy. Keeping us busy. About your beard. Dari nahi rakhte tum log? Dari rakhiye to standard size nahi hai? I had one of your professors meeting me this morning. And he had a nice, lovely, small goatee. Small, nice beard. But I noticed that he had shaved his moustache. He had shaved his moustache. Now, if I was one of those guys, I would have told him straight away, because somebody had told me once. He said, you shave your moustache? I said, yes. He says, you know, the sunnah is, our Nabi said, he says, you must trim the moustache, not shave it. They're busy, busy. The house is on fire. Our daughters are running away wholesale with the mushriks. Nobody worries about that. They're Christianizing our men and women. For every one boy we lose to Christianity, we're losing three girls. Nobody's worried about that. The house is on fire. Nobody worries about that. They're worrying about the beard. They're worrying about the clothing. They're nasara ka kapa and dali rakta Busy, busy, busy. Everybody is busy. While the enemy is making inroads. We are kept busy. Shaitan, we sab ko busy rakta hai. In India, same. Same. I said, look man, propagate the faith. This is our thikana nahi hai. We are not perfect. I'm asking when will you be perfect? Will you ever be perfect? Is it possible that the whole Muslim world, 1,000 million today, will all become angels? Masoom sab ban jayenge, namazi ban jayenge, dadi wale ban jayenge sab. Can you imagine such a situation? When you become that angelic, you know Allah won't need you anymore, I'm telling you. He'll wipe you out. Look, he's got plenty of angels. Doesn't he? Subhanallah, subhanallah, karne wale bahut hai. Angels, by the million, million. But he needs you. I said, look, he needs you as you are. That you fall. But when you make a mistake and you get up and you cry and you try to walk straight again and you fall again, he loves that. He loves that. He wants you to, to be that. Otherwise, angels, he's made them enough. I'm asking, when will you be perfect? Is there a single man who can tell you that he's perfect? The greatest man you consider, he's the greatest, the most spiritualistic. Sufi is thing. Hamare Peer Sahib. Catch your Peer Sahib and ask him. He says, Peer Sahib, are you perfect? He says, Nay, I'm going to go to This is humility. humility. But if he says, Yes, he's big shaitan. Whoever says, Yes, I'm perfect, he's big shaitan. So the man in humility says, I'm going to go to the house. Allah is going to go So when will you be perfect? When will you start? They're waiting for perfection. Hamara I said, look in South Africa, in my own country now. I said, you know the Muslim, he is the topmost in brotherhood, in piety, in charity, in sobriety. There is not another community in that country that can show a candle to us. To show us that we are better than you. There isn't. We are boasting and nobody ever contradicts me. In public meetings, I said, look, we Muslims, we have the lowest alcoholic consumption in the country. We have the lowest gambling rate in the country. We have the lowest divorce rate in the country. We have the lowest suicide rate in the country. We have the lowest prison rate in the country. And the highest charity rate in the country. And yet we get no converts. The Christian with all his arrogance, his racism, he is getting converts. What is the reason? You tell me. How is it that he is getting converts? And we are not. Either Islam is a spent force, 
good enough for museum, the Quran and everything about Islam, put it in a museum, like the one you have in Taxila, whatever ancestors, you know, 5,000 years ago what they did, in Taxila outside our Pindi, Nahi dekha hai ga jaakar dekhna, is worth seeing. What our ancestors, 5,000 years ago, what they had here, on this subcontinent. A water bomb sewerage. You know that? They made gold jewelry, as modern as today's jewelry. 3,000 years before Jesus was born. They made muslin cloth, a yard muslin cloth, you can hold it in the palm of your hand. Go and see it in the museum in Taxila. Then you know. What happened? A people so high, when the, when the white man was living in caves wearing skin, my ancestors were civilized. Then what happened? The same neglect, shirk, mushriks. Allah brought them down to that level. You and I, nobody is exempt. His law is eternal for all times. In Pakistan, talking about India, we can laugh at them now. The fools are not seeing that the solution to the problem is change the untouchables. Accept them, bring them in. No, we are busy with you. Ke musalman ko musalman karo. In the meantime, the enemy is going to wait for you to become perfect. In Pakistan, for what I'm given to understand, you can correct me. So there are so many cities in Pakistan with an average population of more than 100,000 Christians each. Karachi, more than 100,000 Christians. Multan, more than 100,000 Christians. Lahore, more than 100,000 Christians. I was saying, Sialkot to somebody correct is more than 200,000 Christians. They are coming from 5,000 miles, 10,000 miles away and converting our people. They are our people. They can be untouchable. Whatever they are, they are in your field. They are in your home. And the guy comes outside and steals them. And you do nothing. You don't even feel jealous. This is what I found in Malaysia. The Malay has the sickness. I don't know if there are any Malays. Go and tell them that we are Malaysian, your, your people. In the Islamic University of Kuala Lumpur, the Christian missionaries are running amok. The Muslim does nothing. Oh, they're converting the Buddhists, they're converting the Hindus. So what? You see, we Muslims are safe. Because if a Malay becomes a uh, murtad, he loses his nationality. So now the government is saving you. It's not your being, it's not your iman, it's not your thinking. It's the government is saving you. By threat that you won't be a Pakistani. If you become a Christian, finish. No longer you have no longer Pakistani nationality. In the meantime, the missionaries are on this campus. They're converting the people wholesale. And the Malay, my brother, very good fellow, very nice, soft, nice chap. The sweetest people. Malays and Indonesian. Nice, soft people. Nice, soft people, you know. Ready for to be chewed up by everybody. You, because you're so nice, so kind. My father taught me, he says, my son, don't be so sweet that people will chew you up, and don't be so bitter that people spit you out. I'm trying to keep the balance. <laughs> the Malay is too sweet. The Indonesian is too sweet. So they chew him up. They chew him up. In Indonesia, they have perverted more than 15 million Indonesians into Christianity. And by the turn of the century, they want to make Indonesia a Christian nation. And every sign shows that they will succeed, the Christians. They are now working concertedly, the, all the Christians. In my country, they are fighting like cats and dogs. We have a thousand different sects and denominations among the whites of South Africa, and three thousand among the blacks. Different sects and denominations. They are fighting for converts. Not so in Indonesia. They says we go for what is called Operation Overkill. Inki Satya Nas Kardo. Just finish them up, man. We'll Christianize them all. Later on, we'll fight for the loot. You either bring them into Roman Catholics or your Jehovah's Witnesses. We'll fight later. Now, time is wipe them out. And things are working. In Pakistan, we say, look, we are so far, we haven't lost a Han yet. And we haven't lost a such and such. We haven't lost a Didat yet. Is that consolation? Ah, these are Achuts. These Achuts no longer will remain Achuts. They won't be achutes all the time. They're getting education and they have a right to demand equality according to that percentage of the people here in government. You say no, you are unjust. You have to be fair to people. We want that in, in, uh, in, in Hindustan. We say, look man, we are not in the army, we are not in the police force, we don't get government jobs. We have a right, we are so many percent of the people, at least that percentage we should be given opportunity. We are asking and we think it's right to ask that. Won't they have the same right? They would have the same right. A potential fifth column. So what you do? Go and kill them? No. 
First them back into Islam, due to Islam, says, no, Allah says, like Rafid Deen. What do you do? I said, what about you? Why aren't you converting them? They are in your field. They are in your yard. They are in your home, in your homeland. Why aren't you converting them? But the jail hai, chamar hai. Mm -hmm. I said, now, nah. when Allah does yastabdil qawman khayrakum, I said, he puts upon you a people that you look down upon most. They are going to rule you. How? I don't know. How is it? 10% of the people can rule you. Can rule you. 10%. You don't need 80%, 90%. Look at the countries in, uh, in Africa. Muslim countries. Muslim majority nations. Ruled by Christians. Tanzania. 85% Muslim. Ruled by Christians. Tanzania in the University of Dar es Salaam. A nation is 85% Muslim. Only 5% are in the University. Why? Are they all imbeciles? Lunatics? Muslims got no brains? What is happening? No, there is a policy. They'll make you to fit into that condition of becoming sweepers yourself. And through education and learning, they will be there. They'll be your, your ministers in parliament. They will be there. You can't say no. This is a democratic country. Our constitution enshrines freedom of religion. By all means. But what are you doing? Now, this is for you, my children, at the university. You are the future leaders of this nation. I don't know, we have wasted 40 years already. 40 years have gone, I tell you, down. The water has flown and we have done nothing. The elders have done nothing. It is for you now to think and plan what is wrong with us. How is it that we can't do what the Christian can do? How is it that he is dedicated? He can leave his heart and home, his comfortable homes in England and America and come along in these unhygienic conditions in the villages. Hmm? Eating dust, smoke in the eyes, flies buzzing around him. How can he do it? How can he, 79 refugee Christian missions there in Pesh, around Peshawar, and we have only nine. What is it that motivates them? How is it that Islam can't motivate us? What is it? This is the message I leave with you, my dear children, that look, heed the warning. Allah says, يَسْتَبْدِلْ قَوْمٌ غَيْرَكُمْ He will substitute in your place another people. ثُمَّ لَا يَكُمُ أَمْثَالَكُمْ and they won't be like you. Jazakallah for this opportunity of talking to you all. Shukran. Dear brothers, as uh, Dr. Hassan Shafi announced earlier, the floor is now open for questions, particularly from the students. So anyone wishing to ask any questions can do so. There is no such thing as the best method. There are so many ways of doing a job. One is, we say, look, we ourselves are not perfect. Let us improve ourselves. Very noble thought. But as I said, I said, look, the enemy is not going to wait for you. Till you become perfect, then he will give battle to you. In the meantime, he's stealing your children. So you need another front. At every front, you have to give battle. And each and every one, according to his genius, according to his talents, he must use them for the cause. I have chosen this method of speaking to Jews, Christians, Hindus, atheists and agnostics, a method laid down in the Quran where Allah Bari Ta'ala says, Qul ya ahlal kitab, ta'alaw ila kalimatin sawa'im bainana wa bainakum. This last phrase, sawa'im bainana wa bainakum. That means let us come to common terms as between us and you. Common terms, finding common terms. In legal terminology, they say common cause. 
established common cause, get to some understanding from which you can move. So that is the method that I'm using. Anything the man speaks, anything he says, anything he claims, the Christian, he makes certain claims. He is foremost in raising the dust throughout the world. At the moment, there are some 70,000 full-time crusaders active in the world, uh, of which 60% are Americans. That is, 42,000 Americans, crusaders, are raising the dust throughout the world. They're not worried about the people at home. The American Christian banal. They are rotten to the core at home. In their own motherland, they have problems beyond imagination. Last June or the June before, 300,000 sodomites, you call them Qawmiluth, they gathered in San Francisco on a pilgrimage led by 50 lesbians on motorcycles. America has a surplus of women, 7.8 million more women than men. There's problems. They have problems. If every man in America got married, there'd still be 7.8 million, almost 8 million women who can't get husbands. Problem. In New York, they have 1 million more women than men. If every man got married, there'll be still a million women who can't get husbands. And of the manpower they have there, one third are gays, Kaumilut, Sodomites. Look, they have problems. But they're harassing you. They say, how have lost are the heathen, you heathen. The Hindu heathen, the Muslim heathen, they want to convert the heathen to Christianity. So they're not going to wait for you to become perfect. You have to give battle. How to defend yourself and how to take the attack home. And attack is the best form of defense. But you don't know how to do the job. You are terrified. I said, the people when they return back, our students, they don't do the job. Because they will not thought how to speak to the non-Muslim. They don't know how to speak to the Hindu. How to attract him towards Islam? He doesn't know. How to talk to the Jew? He doesn't know. How to talk to the Christian? He doesn't know. Now, but he knows the size of the beard that you should keep. He knows that. That's what he learned. In wudu, how many farv, how many sunnah, how many nafil, how many waj? He knows. So that is what he's going to tell you. Whatever he's programmed with, that is what is going to come out. So the method is find common ground, equip yourself. Allah says, Kul hautu burhanakum. Anything the man claims, anybody, whether Jew, Christian, Hindu, anybody making any claim for his religion, you say, Kul hatu burhan. So the last telling is that, have you been asking them for the burhan? Muslim, in 1,400 years have you been asking the Christian for the burhan, asking the Jews for the burhan, or anybody? No. So now they are asking you for burhan. You don't do your job, Allah creates parasites. You don't keep the environment clean, then the parasites come to pester you, so that you may keep the environment clean. These are the parasites who create fever in your midst, and we need a fever to wake up. You need a Karbala to wake you up. Islam zinda hota hai har Karbala ke baad. You are waiting for a Karbala, a destruction, loss. Until then, we are all right. It's a dead hai, chamar hai, dead hai, chamar hai. You don't want to do the job. If you want to do the job, you'll find all these things opening up to you. And according to your own genius, you do the job. But don't try to find fault with others. Don't tell them, leave the work you're doing and join me. Don't tell the tabligi, it's a buy, come and join the propagation center. Only thing I'm asking, look, you two, you carry on with your good work. Don't tell me, leave this and do that. Priority number one. I said, don't talk about priorities, because we'll never come to an agreement. What is number one and what is number two, you'll never come to an agreement. Our debates won't end, and in the meantime, you're not doing any work. What you want to do? You want to have karate classes? Look, the Muslim must be fit. He must be the fittest fellow. Allah tells you, وَعِدُّوا لَهُمُ اسْتَطَعْتُمْ مِنْ قُوَّةٍ He said, get ready against them, your strength to the utmost of your power. وَمِنْ رِبَاتِ الْحَيْلِ Even including steeds of war, the most sophisticated weapons of the time, تُرْحِبُونَ بِهِ That you may strike terror into their hearts. No man dare touch you. That's how the Muslim ought to be at any time. Every Muslim should be there. This humble cap, you have it on, but you are a karate expert. A guy touches you, and he goes flying. He touches another guy with a little humble topi, and he goes flying. They won't touch any other Muslim with a topi. He says, nice. These guys are karate experts. In sebat baad raho, dur raho. Look, that's how it ought to be. Turhibuna bihi. Adu wallah wa adu wakum. Who are the enemies of God and your enemies. Wa akharina min dunihim. There are others besides these. La ta'alamunam, about whom you don't know. Bole bale musulman. 
Bewakuf? Simpletons? You don't know. There are others waiting on the fence by the wayside. As soon as you go down, they'll tear you to pieces. And you're waiting. Go on, man, equip yourself with knowledge. Physically, spiritually, mentally, every field, you must be on top if you are a Muslim. This is not your role that you be in the gutter. That is not the destiny Allah had in store for us. That you get a beating from everybody, from every side. Because the Jew knocks hells into you, the Hindu knocks hells into you. Everywhere, wherever you go, they're knocking hells into you. Is this the role for being Muslim? I says, no, it's your choice. It's your choosing. Because you don't want to make any sacrifice. You don't want to exert yourself a little more. You set aside passing your exam. What about physically? When you come out, come to Africa, you must be a fit fellow, physically too. When you shake hands with a guy, the guy must know that this is a Muslim man. He's got something there up his biceps. Look, my brothers, this is it. Method, there's no such thing as this is the only method. I have used this because the type of customers I get are these customers. And it's all Quranic. Allah is telling you, Kul hatu burhanatu. I have been doing that. And that is the secret of my success. What I achieved is because of that. Everything, cool. it's a natural thing. I didn't know that when I was doing it. I started this about 50 years ago as a schoolboy, just left school. I'm doing that. Kul hatu burhanakum. But I didn't know the Quranic verse. I didn't know Allah wants me to do that. But that's a natural thing. If you behave naturally, you're a Muslim. I was behaving naturally. I was weak. I learned boxing, wrestling, karate. I'm sorry, there was no karate. It's judo. The gentle out of self-defense. I did all that, swimming, all that. What for? Because I was weak. What's the answer? I said, equip myself. No, this is natural. If you're behaving naturally, you're a Muslim. But you don't behave naturally. The guy, you know, there's no jealousy. I said, it's natural to be jealous. Somebody's staring at your wife, your mother, your daughter. And no jealousy in you. <laughs> so the use, the use, cock oil. What are you? What's wrong with you? Something wrong with you. Man comes in your, in your, in your yard, in your field and steals. Animals, wild animals, in your yard, and you feel nothing about it? In my country, they have hunting seasons. You can hunt wild animals. If you are licensed and you go into your own property, in your own farm, you can shoot animals. Or in the farm of your friend, you can shoot animals during hunting season. But if you go into somebody else's farm and shooting wildlife, it doesn't belong to the farmer, it's free for all. The thing goes through the fence into another man's field, it's free for all during the season. But you go into his, on his farm and you shoot an animal, the man can shoot you and kill you. Jealousy. Not in my yard. When the animal is anywhere else, you can shoot, you can do, that's your business. But not in my yard. Here, in your home, the guy comes along from 10,000 miles away and he's stealing your property. He's perverting them to become your enemies. As Hindus, the poor Chaparasi, the poor Dev, the poor Chamar, he's looking up to the Muslims. I know I lived here with them for three years. They look up to the Muslims. For some reason, I don't know what, they look up to the Muslims. They didn't opt to go away to Hindustan. When partition took place, they opted to remain because they must have felt that the Muslims are better people to live with. With all the turmoil, they are Hindus by faith, but I say those Muslims are good people. They're all right. We'll live with them. And they opted to live with us. Now, you were not prepared to absorb them, to take them in. Hmm? So the guy comes from outside and he brainwashes them. And he makes them into zombies against you. Now he knows that he's better than you. He says, you Muslims, my boss, you my owner, mm -hmm. you are worshipping the dead prophet Muhammad. And as such you're going to go to hell. I've got the living Christ. Christ died for my sins. Who died for yours? That mentality. That mentality will make him to sit on your head and he'll be ruling you. I'm telling you in 50 years time, 100 years time, that guy will be ruling you, telling you what to do and how to dance to his tune. He will. And all the European nations will help him to see that he achieves what he wants, what he wants to do. You'll ne you can never have Islamic State. You can never have Sharia. With 10% opposition, you can never have a Pakistan, a Islamic State. The thing, what do you do? I says, change them, talk to them. Even now, talk to them. Ya Ahlul Kitab, Taala, come. Ila kalimatin sawai bainana wa bainakum. That we come to common terms as between us and you. Talk to them. Reason with them. But we ourselves don't know anything about what Allah is telling us. You don't know what Allah is telling you, how to do the job. He's telling you, he's giving you, this is the textbook, he's telling you how to do the job. But that is not a part of our curriculum. I'm happy to hear, last night I made such a statement and I'm told that you have a Dawa Institute here, on your university. 
I hope you are being taught how to talk to the non-Muslim, how to talk to the Jew, how to talk to the atheist, how to talk to the agnostic, how to talk to the Hindu. You've got to learn. Just knowledge, book knowledge, if you don't know how to impart it, you're wasting time. You are wasting time, university time, public money, everything you are wasting. Unless you learn this knowledge, how you're going to use it when you come out. And in the meantime, you start using it and see. Try it out. Try it out now. There are no Muslims around. Talk to them. Reason with them. Take them home for tea. Give them some bajas and samosas and do the job. Inshallah. How? Any other question? I prefer questions from the floor because people, you see what happens, our students. This is also, this is also another thing that you have to acquire. You must learn to stand up and speak. This is, any coward can do this. You know, I could have written half a dozen questions and gave my friend and said, look, you, you send it to me so I can pass time. Look, stand up, that's good. If there's nobody, then we'll deal with this. Okay. If there's nobody on the floor, then we'll deal with this. In the meantime, let's have it from the floor. True. Yes. You see, this is uh, something that is be and puts us on the defensive. It makes us to bow our head down in shame. I give you an example from my own life. You see, I live in Durban, and from Durban there is a town called Stanga, about 45 miles away. And I had some problems there, legal problems. So I used to go there and meet a, my legal lawyer, lawyer who happened to be Hindu. So every time when I'm returning, he gives me a lift. For some reason, he wanted to come to Durban, he gives me a lift. And in the car, I start preaching to him Islam. I tell him, you know, how Islam, how beautiful it is, how it can solve the problems of mankind and everything. What we are usually we preach to others, they look, Islam is great. On the second trip, the guy is telling me, he says, look, Mr. Didat, you're talking a fat lot about Islam. But you know, I can tell you as a lawyer, I'm handling a case of the Muslims about the Madrasa Trust, you know, a religious school. Two sets of trustees are going to court and I'm handling the case for one group of trustees, Muslim trustees. There is another case also simultaneously going on in that town between the trustees of the masjid. And I'm also handling the case for one of those groups. And you tell me Islam can solve all problems, problems of mankind. You can't solve your own petty problems. The madrasa can't solve the problem and the masjid can't solve the problem. And you're talking about Islam solving problems of mankind. I felt, you know, how do you feel? You feel like a sheep man. You feel like a sheep. I told him, I answered, I don't know whether you'll agree with me. I said, you see, Mr. Krishna, that was his name. I said, Mr. Krishna, the next time this venerable gentleman comes to you, you know, with a dark patch on the forehead for making so many sujoots, and that Turkish coat, you know, the lamba jha, tum Pakistani coat kehte hain, am look Turkish coat kehte hain usko, with that long coat, pious, Muslim with nice beard, when he comes to you next time with his problems, these problems, just ask him one simple question. That uncle, Haji Saab, have you read the Quran once in your lifetime with understanding? Once. In your whole life. Tum double Haji hue, panch ke namazi hai, mashallah. Did you read this Quran once in your lifetime with understanding? Madrasa group, any Muslim comes along to you with a problem, just ask him this question, have you read the Quran once in your lifetime with understanding? And I said, you in your life, you won't come across that Muslim. That's the answer. The answer is, we are not going to the Quran. Nobody goes to the Quran. We are prepared to die for this book. If this book is insulted, we are prepared to go to war. But nobody is prepared to live for it. Nobody lives for it. Nobody knows what's going on. What is Allah talking to you? What is saying the Wadda Mukhari was reading to you? Nobody knows. It is all for beautification, for spiritual blessing. Sawab, sawab, sawab. I say so you're going to get sawab, but the real sawab, the benefit is following instruction. And this is the reason why we find it in our disposition. If you allow Allah Baritala to speak to you in a language that you understand, if you understand Indonesian and you can have an Indonesian translation. If you can't understand Arabic, read the Indonesian translation and allow Allah to speak to you in Indonesian. The Urdu speaking people, I say get an Urdu translation. 
But you people at the university, you must have an English translation for so many reasons. So you master. You master that you can use this as a weapon, as a tool, as an adornment, as a weapon of defense and attack. All this, this Quran will serve for you. But you have to know what Allah is talking about. What is He telling you? And if you don't allow Him to talk to you, all this is water on duck's back. This is all entertainment. I'm entertaining you all. And at times some great people come along and make you to shed bitter tears too. But it's only for a moment. The real change only comes if you allow Allah to talk to you and He is talking to you and to me and to every passerby in the street without any intermediary. No Jibreel required. Allah is talking to you without Jibreel. Allow Him to talk to you and see what He does to you. Then this excuse will go, inshallah. You know, our inactivity, our uh, un-Islamic behavior, all that inshallah will go if you allow Allah to talk to you. Like this, we hear our sheikhs and imams, mashallah, but allow Allah to speak to you in the first person. That would change. Yes. See, there are laws and laws. There are laws and laws, sets of laws, regulations. Natural laws. You follow certain natural laws, whether you are a believer or a non-believer. Allah's promises is that you must get the fruit. As Iqbal says, Muslim a'i huwa kafir tumi lehuro kusur. Tum me huro ka koi chahne wala hai nahi. Jalwe tur to maujud hai Musa hai nahi. You see, he says, there is nobody among you who is desirous of this huri in Jannah. Jalwe tur, the glory on the mount which Musa saw, is here with you. But there is no Moses to find it. So, the kafir, when he behaves as a Muslim ought to behave, certain rules and regulations, prosper, he must prosper. He is, as the shire says, deen kafir, fikr tadbiro jihad, deen kafir, fikr, tadbiro jihad, deen mullah, fi sabirillah fasad. So, if this is what you are doing, you get the fruits of your facade. The other guy is thinking, planning, scheming. He's thinking about landing on the moon. Kennedy, ten years before they landed on the moon, they said, within the next ten years, we will land on the moon. And they did it. There's a law. Allah is telling you about the law in the Quran. You see, He's telling you about His law in the Quran. You read it, but you don't implement it, you don't understand anything. Ya ma'ashar al-jinn wal-ins, He's telling you. So, oh, gathering of insu, jinn wal ins, it's of jinns and men. And is tatatum min tan and tan fuzu min attar is samawati wal ardi fan fuzu la tan fuzu na illa bi sultan. It says, penetrate to the regions of the heavens and the earth. But you cannot penetrate except by his permission. Talking about penetrating the regions of the heavens and the earth when they even had it invented an ox wagon wheel, a wagon wheel. Talking about penetrating regions of heaven and earth. Allah is telling you 1400 years ago that you can penetrate, but by His permission. So you've got to seek His permission. How do you get His permission? No, that's not the permission. What? Rosa rakte hain? Fasting? Permission. License. How do you get license? You're driving license. Because you are a namazi? You're a tahajjud gazar? Why? How do you get your license? So number one, you can read signs, you can read uh, notices, you, your eyes are alright, physically you are okay, you know the rules of the road, and you can drive and you pass your test, you get your license. Whether you're a Hindu, whether you're a Christian, whether you're a Muslim or an atheist. That's the law of the country. You have to pass through certain tests, you got your license. In my country also, business, certain requirements, get your license. This other thing, get your license. You want to penetrate the regions of the heavens, you want to go to the moon, get your license. License? How do you get your license? Knowledge. How are you going to land, get onto the moon? Number one is propulsion. You must know everything about propulsion. You must know about the fuse that you can use. You must know about the gravity around the earth to get out of this gravity. What do you need? And then when you land on the moon, let's say you landed there, they say, well, once you got out of this gravity, it's all plain sailing. You know, without any energy, you'll keep on moving in whatever direction. If you just jet here and jet there, you can reach your target. No fuel expense. MashaAllah. 
Now you land on the moon. You know what's going to happen? As soon as you come out of your capsule, if you are in the sun, sunny side, two minutes your blood boils, finish. There won't be anybody to come back to tell you what, what went wrong. What, what went, went, wrong. went wrong. So while the guy is sitting on his backside here, he knows about the heats and vapors of the uttermost planets in the universe. He knows that when he lands on the moon and he was sitting on a chair with one of his legs in the light and the other in the shade, the one in the light, the blood will boil in two minutes. It's dead. The one in the shade, two minutes will be frozen because there is no atmosphere there. Oh, he knows all that. So now, he says, now to get a license to go there, now you need some, uh, some clothing, some covering that will save me from the heat and save me from the cold. And then look, I'll be gone for so many days and I can't take this thing out <laughs> to pass, you know, to excrete and to urinate. So we say, yeah, yeah, intazam karo, wo intazam karo. He did everything and then he said, right, now we press the button. Allah gave him the license to go whether he's a believer or a non-believer. This is his law. So you follow the law, you reach your destination. That other guy, the kafir, the kafir is following certain laws, he's getting the fruits. You don't. Allah is telling you to look at the birds. The only birds you watch, they call bird watching in, in the English language, they say when you look at women. That's called bird watching. Allah is telling you to look at the birds. You look at the birds, you mean study the birds. Look at the camel. You look at the camel. No, the white man is doing it. He is telling you about the camel. You need it. He is telling you what to do. And you don't touch this book. You don't know this book. This book is a closed book to you. That guy without reading the book is following instruction. So he gets the fruit. You own the book. Keep make a tawis around your neck. It's only a dead weight. Millstone you're going to carry around your neck. Get the instruction. Follow the instruction and see what Allah does to you. Yes, my son. What is the responsibility of all individuals? Yes, that's his first you question. Have let me let me answer that. Let me answer that first yes, question. Sir. What is the responsibility of all individuals? I say the responsive responsibility is according to your capacity. Yes. You have a feeling what you should do to improve the ummah. That's your responsibility. You don't come to change me. Don't go to change the tabligi fellow. Right? Don't go to try and change the secularist. Whatever you have in mind that should be done, you do that job. You are an expert. You are the fittest man Allah has created for that job. You are a coward, you want to pass it on to somebody else. He says, you know, they have a problem. What about that? And what? I said, look, you are the guy. This guy comes to me, a doctor Parvez in Peshawar. He says, the communist, the communist is the problem. I said, right, you are the guy. You doctor Parvez, you must tackle the communist. In other words, he's telling me, leave the Christians, man. Go and tackle the Russian. I said, look, what are you trying? I said, did the Russian come and give you Das Kapital? He says, no. I said, look, the Christians is giving Bible to my people. He's harassing my people. He's giving this book, this book, this book. I show you all the evidence. So I'm involved in that. You think about the communists. You are the fittest man to give Bible. But you coward. You want to pass it on to me. This is what's the trouble with us. You want to pass everything on to me. He said, look. What about this? I said, yes, what about that? You are the guy. Why don't you go to the villages? Why don't you go among those untouchables? Why don't you talk to them? You are running to Africa with the Tablighi Jamaat. Foreign exchange. You are wasting foreign exchange. You got problems here. The Muhajirs and the Pakhtuns are fighting like cats and dogs, killing one another. They are stealing your children here. And what you want to do in Africa? Having a jolly good time. So I said, look, you do your job at home. You say this is to be done, you are the man. And everybody, don't pass the buck. You know, passing the buck is the oldest game in the world. You know, passing responsibility. You know, uska kaam hai, zya nahi karta hai, wo nahi karta hai. I said, what are you doing? What are you doing? That professor should be doing that. I said, what are you doing? So, the answer is, you, everyone, who's got some thoughts, you are the fittest person for that job Allah has created. But you don't want to take that honor, that responsibility. You want to pass the buck which is the most cowardly thing to do. And we are all cowards by nature. We are cowards, all of us. We want to pass. I want somebody else to take the pill for me. I want somebody else to carry the burden for me. That is Christianity. You, Muslim, carry your own bit, burden. You told me that you have to, uh, I have to do my own responsibility. But what is responsibility? You see, you have to, what is responsibility? Your responsibility is whatever is coming to your mind. The very fact that you stood up to tell me you had something in mind to tell me, that is your responsibility of doing that job. 
whatever you had in your mind. Do they stop you from talking to your fellow students? Do they? That you can't talk? I'm sure you're talking a lot of things which they don't want to hear. But nobody's monitoring you. There's no spies sent upon you. Can't you share your thoughts with your brethren? He said, look man, the trouble with us is we don't know the Quran. Why don't we know the Quran? He said, look, the system of education where we are taught like parrot. We have learned the Quran parrot fashion. This system was a beautiful system for new converts. Two to four hundred years ago, my ancestors were converted by the Arabs. And they taught us a quick way of becoming Muslims or joining them in Salat. So they made us to learn, my ancestors, the elders, to learn by sound. Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen, and a few small surahs. Then the children, they set a system for them, left one of those sailors behind, is to teach his children, you know, it says Alif, Be, Te, Se, Te, Alif, Ba, Ta, Sa, and this is Alif and Fatha, we used to say Alif, Zabar, A, Be, Zabar, Ba, Te, Zabar, Za, A, Ba, Ta, Alif, Lan, Zabar, Allah, Man, Zabar, Allah, Allah, that's how I learned, Be, Lan, Zabar, Balla, Man, Zabar, Allah, Balla, Talla, Salla, and we learned to produce the sound, and according to that system, I learned what I have learned, I can produce the sound, and everybody, non-Arab, produces the sound, without understanding a word. That was a beautiful system for new converts. I said, look man, we are already Muslims for 200 years, 400 years, a thousand years, some of you claim. And you are still treated as a new convert. The system you are following is a system for new converts. So why don't you talk? Then now you will become the education minister one day. He said, look, what is this? What is this? What kind of system is this? That there's no language on earth you learn without understanding. No language. It's a unique system. The Muslims have of learning the Quran without understanding a word. It's a unique disgrace. Why? Right? Can you stop that? And you think that your, 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 your Ustad will stop you from doing that? Telling the others, say, look, man, what is this? What has happened to us? Ask, ask to the Molvi, sir, maybe your uncle is a Molvi. Talk to him and say, what is this? This is a system for new converts, man. When will we become Muslim? I was treated as a new convert. My son was treated as a new convert. And my grandchildren are still being treated as new converts. I want to know when they will become Muslims. They will never be. In a thousand years, the Pakistani will never be a Muslim in your system of educating the Quran. You will ever be a new convert unless you put on your... You say, what is this, man? You mean to say that your, your doctors and lawyers and your alim can't see that? Maybe they can't. It's your job. You see it? He says, look, man, we must rectify. System. Change the system. The Jews, in 25 years, they made... Hebrew, a dead language to come alive. A language that was dead for 2,000 years. In 25 years, every Jew coming from all parts of the world, speaking different languages, they all have mastered Hebrew. And they made Hebrew an, a, a language of science in the Hebrew university. A dead language. Arabic is a living language. You and I, every Urdu-speaking person at least knows 40% of Arabic without knowing it. 40% of Urdu is Arabic. 40% of Persian is Arabic. You have started the capital. 40% and you can't speak the language. You can't learn the language. There's something wrong, man. Something wrong with your system or with your imagination. You haven't got it. So you deserve to be where you are. No imagination. Deen kafir, fikr. Tadbiru jihad. You are busy. Fi sabilillah fasad. Jagra, jagra, jagra. Look, you are... They were said, I want the students to ask questions. Because my elders might come along, they have an urge, you know, to get at me. I said, save me from them, I want you rather, that you ask me something that I can tell you, look, these are my feelings. You have to change. To unify the Muslims of Pakistan, you need a common language. And that common language is not Urdu. I love Urdu. One of my alim said, if Allah Bari Ta'ala chose a language other than Arabic for the Quran, it would have been Urdu. And I agree with him. But I say, Urdu is not your solution. Urdu is not your solution. I love the language. Wallah, I love it. It's not my language, but I love it. I prefer it to my Gujarati, the Baniya language. See? But I say, Urdu can't solve your problem. Sindhi can't solve your problem. Pushtu can't solve your problem. You need a common language. And that common language is the language of the Quran, language of Allah, language of Jannah. And you already know 40%. And if you can't exploit that, I say, they are lunatics of the highest order. You are lunatics, then you deserve destruction. With 40% capital, you can't learn a language. 
What has happened to you? And you listen to at least three, 52 pre khutbah talks. Khutbah in Arabic. At least, if you don't go for Salat five times a day. And every Muslim knows some portion of the Quran in Arabic. You used to hearing Arabic, Arabic, Arabic. You speak Arabic words. And now yet you can't make Arabic your language. Arabic, had it been followed from the beginning, in 1950, there was an Islamic conference in Karachi. Heads of states came. I was there in Karachi at that time, not at the conference. And the late Aga Khan, the old man, you know, the champion race horse owner, the Aga Khan, the late Aga Khan, he was also called because he had certain prestige. He has a community a following and a rich man. He was supposed to deliver a lecture. For his health reason, he couldn't, so he sent his speech, which was read out to the conference. The speech said that Arabic must become the lingua franca of Pakistan. If you want to keep Pakistan united, this man is talking in 1950. Who is a smiley Shia or a Khoja, you call it. You know, some of us, they say they're not Muslims. But that man is telling us, he said, the thing that can keep Pakistan together is Arabic. Not Bengali, not Urdu, not Sindhi. Because why should the Bengali sacrifice his language for yours? I want to know. Your language is beautiful, Urdu. But my language, I love it. In my mother tongue, there's nothing sweeter than that. And you want me, and we are a majority. And you say this is a democratic state. As a democratic people, we say, look, the majority says Bengali. Why not Bengali? Come on, be reasonable now. No, but you don't like it. It hasn't got culture. I said, look, we are the majority of the people. We'll learn, get culture and everything we'll be able to do in Bengali. Give us a chance. He says, no, Urdu. Why must you sacrifice Bengali for Urdu? You tell me. But if you tell the Bengali, I said, look, man, we can, can only afford at government level two languages. We need English for certain reasons. And we need another language. And what better language than Arabic? Language of Allah, language of the Quran, language of Jannah, language of the Prophet, language of Islam. And it makes us one with the Arab world. We'll make, become all one people, man, one language. So what the Jews did in 25 years, we can do it in half the time. Because already we have a capital. And when you tell the Bengali to sacrifice Bengali for Arabic, he can't say no. When you tell the, the, the Sindhi, he says, look, Sindhi you teach at home. In your own time, teach Sindhi, teach Bengali, teach Gujarati, language of your choice, your mother tongue, you teach. But at government level, level Arabic and English, Arabic and English, wallah, you've got unanimity on that. But the Urdu speaking people, the vested interest of Urdu, everyone has a vested interest. So you have your vested interest. I have a vested interest. Now, if you want to change the national language of Pakistan, let's say from English to French or German, no man, what qualifications they have? I said, no, English. Why English? Because that's my capital. I don't want to lose my capital. I don't want to start learning a new language. So I fight for English. Similarly, you Urdu speaking, you fight for Urdu. Natural. But it's not a solution to your problem. Even now, it's not a solution to your problem. I'm reading as soon as I arrive here. First language. Should it be Urdu? I'm reading in your newspaper. Urdu, Sindhi, or Pushto? And dot, 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 question mark. And what, 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 what? Man, you're dividing the people. After 40 years, you haven't even decided on a language. And you want to solve problems. You want to become one nation. How can you be one nation? You can never be. But if your child from school, he says, starts speaking Arabic, hmm, say, Ma is Muka, he says, my name is Anna Ahmad, and so and so, you're talking, talking, after 25 years, or the next generation, he says, what's your name? He says, my name is Muhammad Ali. He says, where you come from? No, I don't know, I'm from here. He said, no, 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 your fathers, you know, where did they come from? From UP, CP, Delhi? He said, look, I don't know all that. I'm a Pakistani and I'm a Muslim. Shh, one people. Still, now it's not too late. It's rather late than never. There's a saying in Urdu, ke jab hi jage tabhi savera. Whenever you wake up, it's your morning. Don't go back to sleep. But you can do the job. You can talk, you can talk. I'll be gone just now tomorrow. You can talk and create an awareness. Yeah, the injustice that you're doing to the nation by this paratulism, you know, you want to be your nation, your language. So Iqbal says, Jo karega intiyaz rango khum mit jayega, Turki khargahe ho ya arabi wala gaya. Whosoever resorts to these distinctions of color and blood will perish, though he may be a majestic Turk or a blue-blooded Arab. And we are not majestic Turks and nor are we blue-blooded Arabs. More chances of us being destroyed. I'm sure you will.
I think if I got it right, the question is that in Muslim countries, people are not given the freedom to propagate the faith. I think, is that, is yes. that yes. Well, you see, I don't know how I can solve your problem. But in South Africa, we solved our problem. We are less than 2% of the population. The Muslims of South Africa, less than 2%. But we have won a freedom of religion, second to none in the world. There isn't a country on earth which enjoys, gives us better religious freedom than South Africa. It's a racist country. We have racist laws, economically, politically, from every point of view, we are being discriminated against. But religiously, we enjoy a freedom second to none. We have been fighting the government, cases, and we win against the government. I don't know, that's the constitution of my country. I wrote a book, many books I have written, about comparative religion. One of them is, Crucifixion or crucifixion? Crucifixion, the first crucifixion is F-I-X-I-O-N. means to fix a man on the cross and kill. The second fiction is cruci, F-I-C-T-I-O-N, fiction. means fairy tale, kissa kahania. So in English it rhymes beautifully. Crucifixion or crucifixion? You think it's the same, but the spelling tells you the different meaning. And this, somebody brought to the notice of the uh, the director of information, the, our censorship board. So look, this book is a very, very dangerous book for our religion in the country. It must be banned. So the director reads it and he instructs his board. The director instructs his board in Pretoria. The director lives in Cape Town. He instructs his board, ban the book. The board with two priests on the board, they go through the book and they agree that this is a very potent book, very damaging book against the foundation of our faith, because the only real thing, uh, the only thing, imaginable thing that they have in the sales point against Islam or any religion is that Christ died for your sins, and this guy is exploding the myth. Very dangerous. They agree that that is so, but according to the rules of the land, it can't be banned. You can't ban it. It doesn't infringe any law. He doesn't sneer at the other people's belief. There is a law. You are not allowed to sneer. Mm, you know, be a kuf log hen. No, he's just putting forth his case. No doubt he makes a point, very damaging, but nothing we can do. So the director of publication goes on appeal against his own board. Look, there's a sister. The director, he's going on appeal against his own board. Now he's going to hire a QC, a Queen's counselor, a senior counsel, to fight for him against the board his own board to tell him, ban the book. So for the first time they call us to tell us, look, this is what has transpired and now we will not play the devil's advocate on your behalf. You must come and fight your own case if you want to. So we go and fight the case and we win against the government. In other words, there must be ways and means. If you are prepared to, <laughs> we are prepared to pay the price. Our people in politics there in South Africa, the Muslims who are less than 2% of the population, they have made more than 20% of the sacrifices in the political struggle. You see, you don't hear, you hear about Mandela, 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 Biko, 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 but you don't hear that there was Imam Abdullah Harun, he died in prison. Ahmad Timol died in prison. Ahmad Hafiji died in prison. They don't die of sickness, they're beaten to death. More than 20% of the people who die in prison are Muslims. Why? Because they are fighting for their rights. If you don't learn to fight, if you don't learn to sacrifice, then you get what you are getting. This is your own choice. In your own country, in your own motherland, a Muslimic state, like Indonesia, the Muslim got no say. I said, you deserve destruction. You say 120 million Muslims, and the Christian can walk roughshod over you, and you can do nothing about it, there's something wrong with you. That's all. You deserve what you are getting. That is my answer. Wherever you are, you are getting what you deserve.